It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Davenport. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, we saw both the Premier and the former Solicitor General, the now Deputy Premier, dodge questions about their summons from the Public Order Emergency Commission. In fact, since the summons was issued, we haven't heard a word from either the Premier or the former Solicitor General. Hiding the problem does not make it go away, Mr. Speaker. I ask the Premier, will he come clean and commit today to speaking with the Commission? And to apply, the Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, this is a federal inquiry into the federal government's use of the Federal Emergencies Act. From day one, Mr. Speaker, for Ontario, this was a, a policing matter. It was not a political matter. And the opposition knows, Mr. Speaker, politicians don't direct the police. Top officials from the OPP that were running the operation in conjunction with the municipal police agencies and the RCMP are testifying at the committee. Again, Mr. Speaker, this is a federal inquiry into the federal government's decision to use the Federal Emergencies Act. The supplementary question. I'd like to hear the word federal one more time, Speaker. Uh, during, uh, back to the Premier. Back to Order. Order. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. The House will come to order. We've got 58 minutes and 26 seconds to go. We're just getting started. It's the second day. And I have to be able to hear the member that has the floor. Start the clock. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. During uh, former Ottawa Mayor Jim Watson's testimony to the Commission last week, we learned that in his conversations with the Prime Minister in February, the Prime Minister told Mayor Watson that the Premier was, and I quote, hiding from his responsibility for, yes, political reasons. Speaker, the Premier was hiding then when he let convoy organizers occupy Ottawa and harass residents, and he is hiding now by not testifying at the Commission. He cannot hide forever. Will the Premier finally do the right thing, go to Ottawa, and testify before the Commission? Yeah. To reply, the government house leader. Speaker, I think the, the, the Premier is, uh, uh, has been very clear that this is obviously a federal inquiry into the federal government's decision to invoke the Federal Emergencies Act. Now, I know the member opposite doesn't want to to doesn't appreciate that, Mr. Speaker, but that is the case. At the same time, we have been assisting the Commission by ensuring that uh, cabinet documents uh, have been uh uh, have been provided to the Commission, and by also ensuring that uh, both the Deputy Minister of Transportation and the Deputy Solicitor General are made available to the Commission to assist them uh, uh, as they investigate the, uh, the federal government's invocation of the Emergencies Act. The final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. The Commission summoned the Premier and the Solicitor General, the former Solicitor General, because the people of Ottawa and Windsor and everybody else in this province deserve answers and they deserve accountability from this government. Mm -hmm. Instead, this Premier is choosing to hide behind parliamentary privilege? Parliamentary privilege? That's baloney and everybody in this room knows it. He failed Ontarians. I'm going to caution the member on her language. Yep. Caution the member on her language. And recognize her to continue with her question. Okay. I, this, this premier, and and this premier knows it. Failed Ontarians during the convoy and is failing us now. The former Ottawa mayor testified. Order. The prime minister is going to testify, and so is the mayor of Windsor. Other political leaders, Mr. Speaker, aren't afraid to talk to this commission. Why is this premier shaken in his boots? And to, respond, order, order. and to reply, the government house leader. Again, Mr. Speaker, because it is a federal inquiry into the federal government's use of the Federal Emergencies order. Act, Mr. Speaker. 
At the same time, we are assisting the Commission in its work by ensuring that Cabinet documents are provided to the, com uh, to the Commission, by ensuring that the Deputy Solicitor General, the Deputy Minister of Transportation, are made available uh, to the Commission for testimony, Mr. Speaker. Also, obviously, the, uh, the Commissioner of the OPP is, will be testifying, Mr. Speaker. The member herself shows uh, exactly why uh, it, this is political, and, and Mr. Speaker, it shouldn't be. It is a policing matter. We have been hearing that consistently throughout the testimony so far, and that is why we are assisting the Commission in ensuring, Order. as I said, that Cabinet documents are made available, that the Deputy Solicitor General has been made available, the Deputy, uh, uh, the Deputy uh, uh, Minister of Transportation, Mr. Speaker, and we'll continue Spons. to provide that assistance as required. The next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Why, thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Ma'am, uh, questions to the Premier. Premier, nice to see you today. I expect an answer to the question I'm about to ask. Speaker, uh, friends, I wonder if you could clear something up. Is the mayor of Windsor a police officer, yes or no? No. no. Is the prime minister of Canada a police officer, yes or no? No. So could somebody please explain to the people of Ottawa Centre why these officials saw fit Order. to answer the call to testify before a commission, but this premier and the minister responsible, former Solicitor General, won't? Yeah. Let's get to the nut of it, Speaker. Lawyers representing this government told a federal court yesterday that irreparable harm will be caused if this premier and that minister testify before the commission. Could the premier tell us today, Speaker, what irreparable harm are you talking about? To reply, the government has stated. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the, they may change the person asking the questions, but the facts still remain the same. The federal government made a decision to invoke the Federal Emergencies Act. By the status of that legislation, the federal government has to uh, uh, convene a commission of inquiry about their use of the Federal Emergencies Act. We are assisting the commission, Mr. Speaker, as you would expect, by Order. ensuring that the Deputy Minister of Transportation, the Deputy Solicitor General, are made available to the, uh, the commission. We know that the OPP commissioner is also uh, will be testifying, and at the same time, cabinet documents with respect to, to that time period have been turned over to the commission. We will continue to, this, to assist the commission uh, as it investigates the federal government's use of a federal Federal Emergencies Act. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. You didn't get an answer to my question. I really hope the Premier will rise in his place and answer the people of Ottawa Centre today, Speaker, because we deserve it. The question here is, what irreparable harm is this Premier and his lawyers talking about? Because I want to talk about actual irreparable harm. I want to talk about a government that sat on its hands for three weeks while chaos reigned in our city, while residents choked on diesel fumes, while Hate groups ran amok with impunity in our city. And I want to talk about a government that three weeks, it took three weeks for them to tow and fine 39 vehicles, and then they gave those vehicles back to those truck owners without a single fine, despite the fact that this premier promised $100,000 fines. Small businesses like the Ottawa Bike Cafe speaker suffered terribly on Spark Street, and they are right now, as I say these words, teetering on bankruptcy. That's the real harm cause to the people of Ottawa Centre. What are the fake excuses this government is hiding behind today? Okay. Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Obviously, a tremendous amount of resources were provided uh, to, the, uh, to the City of Ottawa and continue to be, but uh, uh, the, the, the current uh, Commission of Inquiry is specific to the federal government's use of the Federal Emergencies Act. And by the terms of that legislation, of course, the federal government had to invoke uh, this Commission of Inquiry. Now, we are assisting the, uh, the Commission, Mr. Speaker, in its work by ensuring that the Deputy Minister of Transportation is made available to the Commission, by ensuring that the Deputy Solicitor General is made available to the Commission. At the same time, certain cabinet documents have been requested. We're assisting the Commission by providing those documents uh, uh, to them, Mr. Speaker, so we will continue to work with and assist the Commission as it does its work. Thank you. The final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I have to say back to the Premier, I feel bad for the House Leader. It's tough to be pushed by a leader who won't take responsibility to face the music when that leader himself won't take a short drive up to Ottawa to face the music himself, despite repeated requests from a commission speaker that he has fact denied that he received them. We know he got them. So we know for Order. a fact that the commission has made clear as several pieces of evidence that the province chose not to get involved at early critical stages of the convoy protests. It's like they forgot the city of Ottawa was in the province of Ontario. And after what people back home have been through, this premier and that minister owe it to us to come to Ottawa and testify. So here's an offer, Speaker, through you to the government. 
I got a nice little hybrid vehicle here, Speaker. I leave on Thursday to go back to Ottawa. Do you need to drive, Premier? Do you need to drive, Minister? I'll take you there myself. The ride is a serious off. Once again, I to remind the members to please make their comments through the chair. Order. Order. Response. Government House Leader. Speaker, and, and, and again, uh, we are continuing to assist the Commission of Inquiry into the federal government's use of, uh, of the Federal Emergency uh, 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 Emergencies Act. We provided cabinet documents as, uh, as requested. We, of course, have made the Deputy Minister of Transportation Order. available. We've made the Deputy Solicitor General uh, available as they do their work, and as well as the Commissioner of the OPP, Mr. Speaker. At the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm heartened to know that the member opposite uh, has a green vehicle. He's very lucky because of all of the work that the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade has been doing to ensure that green vehicles are the future in the province of Ontario. And because of the work of the Minister of Energy, we can now charge up those green vehicles on the on-ramps uh, on uh, between Ottawa and Toronto. Now, we couldn't do that before, could we? We couldn't do that before because they didn't exist, Mr. Speaker. So a congratulations to the me member opposite. We'll continue to work on behalf of the people of the province of Ontario, but really specifically to the Commission. We'll continue to assist them because it's important that we do so. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you. And to the government house leader, there was absolutely nothing funny about what happened in Ottawa or in Windsor, so I suggest that you stop making light of the situation and cracking jokes. My question is to the Premier. The Federal Public Order Emergency Commission has requested to interview the Premier and Minister Jones regarding the use of the Federal Emergencies Act. In my riding, the Ambassador Bridge, North America's largest international crossing, was completely blocked by convoy supporters. Billions of dollars of goods was unable to cross into Canada or the United States, which caused auto and manufacturing plants to close, and thousands of workers were laid off. Cross-border workers, including nurses, were unable to access their jobs. Many small businesses in the area were forced to close and lost significant business due to the disruption. The people in my riding deserve complete transparency from this government. Just the other day, the Premier said he stands shoulder to shoulder with the Prime Minister in support of using the Emergency Act. Why doesn't he stand shoulder to shoulder with, the, shoulder to shoulder with him at the Commission and actually answer their questions? Speaker, why did the Premier and Minister Jones continue to refer, uh, uh, refuse to appear at the Federal Commission? I remind members to make their comments through the chair. The response, the government house leader. I guess that question in itself highlights why uh, the NDP is trying to turn this into something that is political. What we're trying to do and what the Commission is trying to do is get to the bottom of the fact of whether the Emergencies Act was required. It is, by law, the, uh, the federal government has to uh, invoke this Commission of Inquiry, Mr. Speaker. Now they have asked us for certain uh, documents, cabinet documents, and we're assisting the Commission ensuring that that happens. It is a policing matter, as the Premier has said, Mr. Speaker. It shouldn't be a political matter like the opposition is trying to make it. That is why we have offered and ensuring that the Deputy uh, Minister of Transportation is available to ask the questions, as the member has highlighted, the member for Ottawa Centre uh, have highlighted. We're also making the Deputy uh, Solicitor General uh, available, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to assist the Commission as it does its work to investigate the federal government's use of the Federal Emergencies Act, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. What that response shows is this government and this Premier's uh, will to completely abdicate responsibility for the decisions that they did or didn't make while the crisis was happening in Windsor and Ottawa. For six days, my community was in crisis due to the blockade at the Ambassador Bridge. Residents in Sandwich Town were unable to access other parts of our city. Some were afraid to even leave their homes. Truck drivers trying to move goods back and forth across the border were stuck on the road for days without food or access to washrooms. The impact lasted far beyond the blockade speaker. The Premier and former Solicitor General are dodging requests to be interviewed by the Commission and are committed to fighting a summons to appear. Speaker, the Premier has long said that the buck stops with him, and yet he won't appear at the Commission to answer questions about his decisions. What is Premier Ford and Minister Jones hiding, and why Order. won't they testify to ensure that something like this never again happens in my community, or in Ottawa, or in Fort Erie, Jim. or anywhere else in this province? 
the government has to do. I, I suspect some of the elements of the member's question is exactly why there is a federal inquiry into the federal government's use of the Federal Emergencies Act, Mr. Speaker. That is why, of course, that we are assisting the Commission in its work by ensuring that the Deputy Minister of Transportation is available, that the Deputy uh, uh, Solicitor General is available, and by ensuring that Cabinet documents relevant to the Commission's uh, inquiry are also made available. We will continue to assist uh, the Commission of Inquiry as it does its work in assessing whether the federal government's invocation of the federal Emergencies Act was required at the time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you so much, Speaker. Good morning. My question is for the Associate Minister of Housing. Speaker, as you know, Ontario's housing supply is in crisis. Skyrocketing demands has far outpaced the construction of new supply, making the Canadian dream of home ownership far out of reach for many Ontarians. And with Ontario's population projected to grow by millions in the coming years, the demand will only increase. Many of my constituents in Mississauga Centre, from hardworking young professionals to young families, students, new Ontarians and seniors, are looking to downsize and are finding themselves priced out of the market and unable to find housing options that meet their needs. Speaker, can the minister elaborate on what steps our government's newly proposed housing supply action plan will take to ensure that our province is able to achieve our goal of building 1.5 million homes over the next 10 years? Thank you very much, Speaker, and I want to thank the hardworking member from Mississauga Centre for that very important question. Speaker, we know that the status quo is simply not working. If we continue on this path without making bold and transformative changes, the next generation will not have the same opportunities for success as previous generations have. The proposed legislation, Mr. Speaker, will take several steps to make sure Ontarians get the additional housing supply we so critically need, Speaker, by permitting more gentle intensification, an issue that opposition has on many, many times said transcends party lines. Our proposed uh, changes will lay the foundation to more missing middle housing, giving Ontarians more choice and flexibility. Additionally, Speaker, we're reducing building costs to incentivize our private sector and nonprofit partners to get more housing built faster. Speaker, together, with all hands on deck, we can ensure that home ownership is attainable for all Ontarians across our great province, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that response, and I also thank him for recently visiting Mississauga and sitting, out, uh, sitting down with stakeholders uh, on this topic. Speaker, as the Minister mentioned, the proposed changes will make alterations to current municipal fees levied on new developments and construction of new housing units across the province. I understand that for every month that approvals are delayed, it can add anywhere from $2,600 to $3,300 onto the cost of building a single-family home or condominium unit in the Greater Toronto Area, including in Mississauga. Furthermore, many municipalities have increased fees, which are ultimately passed on onto the new home buyer. Speaker, can the minister let us know how this legislation will address this very problem? The associate minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. And again, I want to thank my honourable colleague for that follow-up question. Speaker, at a time when Ontarians are facing a rising cost of living, we recognize the need to keep costs down for all Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. It's concerning trend to see municipal fees and charges levied on new and affordable housing skyrocket by up to 36 per cent, Mr. Speaker, without considering the impact fee increases have upon tenants and future homeowners, housing prices will rise and affordably will worsen. Our proposal, if passed, will reduce the cost of residential development by freezing, reducing and slowing future growth of municipal charges. Speaker, as I've said before, our government will not shy away from bold and decisive action under the leadership of this Premier to streamline municipal approval processes and reduce costs for Ontarians entering the housing market. Mr. Speaker, like we've said time and time again, the previous, the previous government let down the people of this province. We will not. Here, here. Question, the member for Tabiskaming Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. In 2017, the Premier of the province was asked to testify at a very high-profile inquiry in Sudbury. Premier Wynne could have invoked parliamentary privilege to avoid testifying. 
but she did not. And I will quote what she said. I will testify. I will go along with the process and do what I can to clarify. Premiers have waived privilege before. Why won't Premier Ford? Well, well, Speaker, I, I think uh, in the, the member's example, the former Premier herself was the subject of the inquiry, <laughs> right? So it is certainly a, a big difference. But having said that, Mr. Speaker, having said that, uh, we, are, of course, are going to continue to work with the Commission. Uh, we have provided cabinet documents for the Commission, as has been, uh, as has been required. We can continue to assist them by ensuring that not only the Commissioner of the OPP, but the Deputy Solicitor General are made available to the Commission. The Deputy uh, Minister of Transportation are made available. Look, the difference, again, is that this is a federal commission of inquiry into the federal government's decision to invoke the Federal Emergencies Act for the first time, Mr. Speaker. So, as uh, you would expect, uh, the federal uh, federal government has asked for the commission has asked for assistance in that, and we are providing that assistance in the capacity that I have mentioned on numerous occasions in the House. And the supplementary question, Speaker. Twenty years ago, Premier Harris also didn't shy away from an inquiry. He had no problem speaking to the Walker in an inquiry, and I quote: "As head of government, I'm accountable." Speaker, to the Premier, why won't he follow the lead of Premier Harris, be accountable, testify before the Commission, tell his story? Thank you. House Leader. Well, uh, again, Mr. Speaker, the, the member is highlighting a provincial inquiry into a provincial matter. One would expect that when the provincial government uh, uh, has an inquiry, that uh, those people who need to be called are actually brought forward, Mr. Speaker. But in this instance, the member himself is highlighting exactly why the Prime Minister would be in front of that Commission of Inquiry and why, in this instance, they are asking us for assistance, and that assistance is by ensuring that the Deputy Solicitor General, the Deputy Minister of Transportation, that any relevant Cabinet documents during that time period are made available. We are assisting the Commission by ensuring that that, that, that happens. The Commissioner of the OPP is there, uh, Speaker, but at the same time, as the member has said, and I'd ask him maybe to reread his question because it might better clarify for him uh, that this is a federal inquiry into a federal act, Response. Uh, Mr. Speaker. And having said that, we will continue to assist as required because I think it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Mississauga Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Economic Development and Job Creation and Trade. Earlier this month, the minister was in Germany and Austria to continue meeting with and attracting investment in the automotive and EV sector. As being someone myself that worked in the auto industry for 31 years at Ford, we can all agree that Ontario should continue to focus on its manufacturing capability and ensure that there are plenty of jobs in, for families across the province. Speaker, will the minister, pr minister provide us with an update on his recent trade mission to Germany and Austria? Respond, Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Job Creation. Speaker, the mission to Germany and Austria was an opportunity to build on the $16 billion in transformative EV and auto investments that were brought to Ontario in the last 22 months. With all of the turmoil surrounding Europe, these countries are feeling increased pressures on their supply chain. This is what we heard from them. Their dependence on materials from Russia and China have caused them to rethink about hitting a reset button. They now know that Ontario has everything they need. We have the critical minerals. We have the refining capability necessary to make EV batteries and all of the components. And as the number two auto jurisdiction in all of North America, they know that we have a proven ecosystem of reliable partners. We have the skilled trades, 65,000 annual Response. STEM grads, public health care, 94 per cent clean energy, something they're not going to find in the U.S. Our message was clear. If you're in the EVs, you need to be in Ontario. Yeah. A supplementary question. 
Speaker. It sounds like the trade mission to Germany and Austria came at a critical time for Ontario's economy. The future of transportation is shifting towards electrification, and with this comes a renewed focus on clean electricity. The minister is right. Ontario must continue to promote itself as a great place to do business. Speaker, will the minister shed some light on how Germany and Austria feel about investing in Ontario and what they see our competitive edge here in Ontario? Minister of Economic Development. Companies worldwide are looking for stable, reliable, trusted jurisdictions. They want ethically sourced materials and products made using clean energy. We showed the companies that EVs and batteries made in Ontario are assembled with 94 per cent clean energy. They now know we invested half a billion dollars in DeFasco to convert their coal-fired ovens to electric arc furnaces so the steel in our cars is green. Our minerals are brought out of the ground and refined under the safest and most modern method on earth. But, Speaker, we then outlined how EVs and batteries that are made in the U.S. are not green. They are made by burning coal. When you buy an EV, you expect the vehicle to be a green vehicle with a green battery and green steel. So our message to, was very, very simple. You need to make your EV products in Ontario, and we're here and open for business. The next question. The member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Municipal Affairs and Housing. I am joined today by Susan DeRosa, a tenant whose purpose-built rental is set to be demolished and replaced by a condo. I have been working with Susan and her neighbours at 145 St George to ensure that if the city approves the development, she and her friends and her neighbours still get the right to return to their home at the same rent once the condo is complete. But this government is looking at scrapping the rules that gives tenants the right to return to their home at an affordable price, which threatens thousands of affordable private market rental units across our city. Minister, can you ensure that renters who are evicted can return to their rent-controlled apartment once the building is complete? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, well, Speaker, first of all, I want to thank the member for University of Rosedale. I saw her on CP24 this morning praising our government for Bill 23 and the fact that it would be creating new housing in the province. So I look forward to uh, her party and uh, the other opposition members who asked us to put many of these measures into the bill. I look forward to them supporting uh, Bill 23 as we move forward. But it, you know, in debate this morning, both her and the uh, opposition House Leader mentioned this consultation that the government is doing on the rent replacement bylaws that are in a very few select communities in Ontario. Um, you know, I, I'm just wondering about the motive of the question. Is this setting up uh, the opposition for voting against a bill? Uh, you know, many times the members opposite have presented suggestions on increasing Ontario's housing supply, Response. and a lot of those suggestions are incorporated uh, in Bill 23. We think it's a bill that everyone in this uh, chamber can support because desperately we need more rental housing stock. The supplementary question. Minister, we, knew, we need to build more housing supply and more rental stock, but not, but not. I apologize to the member for University of Rosedale for having to interrupt. I have to be able to hear the member. Start the clock. The member can continue. We need to build more housing, but not at the expense of the affordable housing that we. Stop the clock. The government side will come to order. The, the opposition will come to order. If it happens again, I'll start calling out the members by name. Start the clock. The member can continue. 
We need to build more homes, but not at the expense of the affordable rental homes we already have. My question is back to the Minister for Municipal Affairs and Housing. This government wants to reduce and exempt development fees for some homes. These fees pay for transit, for daycares, for parks, and for the services that residents need. They also help build new affordable housing. Toronto is already experiencing a funding shortfall of more than $800 million. What is this government's plan to help municipal municipalities make up for this massive loss in funding? Reply, Minister Ms. Blairs and Housing. Well, first speaker, I want to deal with her first question again. Uh, you know, we are launching consultations to determine how to protect our supply of housing, and I want to make sure for the people that are in the, the gallery, it's important to keep in mind that the proposed amendments would not impact renter protections or requirements under the Residential Tenancies Act. Our government has made changes to the RTA to better protect tenants, to stop rent evictions, to avoid evictions. I just wish the opposition would have supported it. On the issue of, uh, of uh, the charges, we have to get those baseline costs down so that we have more affordable housing and more attainable housing. But even in our own financial information returns, it shows that municipalities have $8 billion in their D.C. reserves, including $2.25 billion in the City of Toronto. We're going to continue to work Spons? with our municipal partners. We're also going to work with the federal government on their $4 billion housing accelerating fund. We think that would help municipalities as well. The next question. The member for Don Valley. This month, this month, Ontarians told us that the health care system was in crisis, but the Premier and Minister of Health were nowhere to be found for six weeks. Then in August, the CEO of Ontario Health went on record admitting that the health care system was under tremendous strain. Despite this, we kept hearing from the government that patients were getting care in the time that they needed, even though they weren't. Because this month, I discovered leaked Ontario Health data revealing that for the month of August, ER wait times, lengths of stay, ambulance offload times, and time to inpatient bed were the worst that they've ever been going all the way back to 2008. The healthcare system took a nosedive in the last 12 months alone. Yesterday, the member for Eglinton Lawrence quoted Dr. Ronald Cohn to justify her position that our healthcare system has adequate capacity. Yet Dr. Cohn's quote was incomplete. In the same article she referenced, he conceded that, faced with mounting patient volumes, quote, I am worried about how Question. much more we can do. Will the Minister of Health explain why, in each of these examples, the government's position has disagreed with the position of their own sources? And to reply on behalf of the government, the member for Eglinton Lawrence and Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, frankly, Mr. Speaker, um, the, the uh, source that he's referencing, uh, Dr. Cohn, said exactly what I quoted, that uh, where the resources would be there for critically ill patients if they needed them at Sick Children's Hospital. I don't know uh, if he wants to challenge me on my reading comprehension, but I think it's pretty good. Um, and um, really, many of the pressures facing our health care system uh, are not new. And, uh, and none of them are unique to Ontario. That's why we've passed our plan to stay open uh, in preparation for a likely winter surge and have been taking all kinds of actions to make sure that we, we are prepared. Um, for example, uh, we have a plan which uh, has a five-point strategy to further bolster Ontario health care workforce, expand innovative models of care, and ensure hospital beds are there for patients when they need them. And the plan outlines what Ontarians uh, can expect, Response. which we think is better health care as we build a better health care system. That's what this government is going to do. Mr. Speaker, I was merely pointing out that the member across didn't read the whole quote. And the plan that she references, a plan to stay open, is the most unambitiously titled plan, I think, in history. It's a plan to stay open. It's not a plan to deliver great patient care. It's a plan to merely stay open, and it's already failing on that mandate. Anyways, I'd like to expand on the Ontario Health data I, I revealed on October 12th, which for the first time revealed the incredibly uh, bleak and deteriorating state of our health care system. The people of Ontario used to get weekly updates from the Medical Officer of Health. They used to have transparent access to an Ontario science table, and now the only way to get real data portraying our healthcare system is to get leaked information from the courage of people who are willing to share documents. I'm hearing now from healthcare workers that there is deafening silence from the Ministry of Health, and also that this weekend, 
There were multiple GTA emergency departments on redirect because they were full. Will the Minister of Health or her designate explain why this government refuses to be accountable to the people of Ontario about Question. the state of our health care system? To reply, the Premier. Well, well thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I find it really rich coming from the, the Liberals that destroyed the health care system, created hallway health care, they fired nurses, shut Order. down the health care system, reduced the funding. What we're doing, we're hiring more Order. nurses, Mr. Speaker, over 12,800 nurses, as they were firing thousands of nurses. We're building new hospitals as they were closing hospitals, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue increasing the funding in health care, ending hallway health care that they created for decades, and we're hiring more doctors, more nurses, creating a university, a medical school university, as they never created a, even one spot into the medical Order. universities. They actually took spots away, Mr. Speaker. Question. The member for Mississauga Centre. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Speaker, Russia's egregious actions and invasion of Ukraine have forced thousands of Ukrainian citizens to leave their homeland. These families, women, children and seniors are being separated because of Russia's unprovoked violence and many of them are trying to find safe refuge here in Canada, the best country in the world. Mississauga is home to over 30,000 Ukrainian Canadians and many institutions like St. Mary's Ukrainian Catholic Church, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, and St. Sophia School. And we are proud to welcome several dozens of new families every week. Speaker, my thoughts and prayers are with everyone who has been affected by Russia's abhorrent invasion of Ukraine especially the children whose childhoods have been affected forever. Question. Speaker, my question to the minister is, what is our government doing to assist these moms and dads, young people, seniors and families settle here in Ontario? Mr. Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Mississauga Centre for that question, but most importantly, what you're doing to welcome Ukrainians uh, here to Ontario. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, stands with Ukraine against Putin's aggression. Across government, we are working with employers, uh, labour unions, faith organizations and community groups to do everything we can to help the people of Ukraine. For those seeking refuge in Ontario, we're prioritizing their immigration applications. We have also expanded Better Jobs Ontario to provide up to $28,000 for Ukrainians who want to train for a new career here in Ontario, and our dedicated jobs helpline has now helped more than 1,000 Ukrainians get the support they need to find meaningful employment. Mr. Speaker, our government is going Response. to continue to stand with Ukrainians against evil every single day. Supplementary question. Speaker, Ukrainians coming to our province to escape Russia's aggression need to know that we are making every effort possible to ensure that they get, can settle here and continue their lives with dignity and means to provide for their families. These are individuals and families who are facing challenges and adversity that few of us could ever imagine. In times of hardship and strife, it is important that the world knows that the Ontario spirit of hospitality and support never wavers for those in need. Speaker, once again, my question to the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. What is our government doing to make sure that the many local organizations across Ontario that have been hard at work have the resources they need to effectively and efficiently aid Ukrainian newcomers? Mr. Labour. Well, thank you, and, and thanks again uh, to the member for that question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, last week I visited Jewish Immigrant Aid Services in North York with my uh, caucus colleague, uh, the member for Thornhill. Uh, we got to see their efforts firsthand and learn more about the incredible work that they're doing to help Ukrainian refugees. Our government is proud to be supporting uh, this agency and 13 other local organizations with $3 million in additional funding towards settlement, housing, employment services and mental health resources. These resources build on the $900,000 we provided the Canadian-Ukrainian Immigrant Aid Society earlier this year. 
Our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, is committed to making sure that Ukrainians coming here to Ontario can settle and feel at home as quickly as possible. Thank you. The next question, the member for London North Centre. Good morning, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. MPPs across the province have been hearing from constituents about the unmitigated crisis in our hospitals. But are Conservative MPPs truly listening? My constituent Colleen told me about her mother's ER experience, and I quote, My brilliant, independent, selfless, always helping others mom had to hope and pray for someone to walk down that hall to attempt to get help. Her oxygen machine was empty. When Colleen brought this to the hospital's attention, the nurse's overwhelmed exhaustion was clear. It wasn't their fault, Speaker. Will this government keep blaming others, keep neglecting public health care, or fund it properly and pay nurses what they're worth? Right on. <laughs> Member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And after decades of underfunding, it is this government that has made unprecedented investments in our health care system. As I said yesterday, health care funding has increased a record 6.2 per cent year over year, the largest increase on record, including an over $5 billion increase in base fund funding, which is an 8.9 per cent increase. A lot of these investments are because we've just gone through a very difficult time for the health care system. As everybody knows, the pandemic has been happening for two years, and that is why we passed a plan to stay open, because you want to stay open. The pandemic had shut everybody down for a while, and we want to make sure we stay open. And that plan has five important initiatives to, once fully implemented, help our uh, health care system get back on track. We've added up to 6,000 uh, more health care workers after that plan is instituted, but you know we've already added 11,700 health care workers since the pandemic began. But our plan our plan also frees up over 2,500 new hospital beds and expands models of care. We're going to continue working for the people of Ontario in finding solutions to make our health care system better. The supplementary question. Speaker, I guess part of my question was answered. They will continue to blame others. Look, this Conservative Party is the, the party of furniture, whereas we are the party with the NDP of the front lines. They're the party of and of health care profiteers, whereas we're the party of the working people. For years, the Liberal Party yeah. cut and underfunded the way for hallway medicine. It's only degraded further since this Conservative government started their callous yeah. evisceration of our public health care system. Yeah, yeah. They have not fixed it. It's gotten worse. Yeah. Just last week, LHS LHSC in London posted a 20-hour delay for their ER and asked patients to bring a snack and activities. Oh. My constituent Tina told me about searching in vain for a nurse or doctor after a partner's ro rods major surgery. No doctors were available and nurses were run off their feet. Tina waited for days until she finally got a phone call. The RNNO surveyed nurses and found that 69% are planning on leaving the profession in the next five years. When will this government admit they've created a crisis and spend money on frontline health care heroes? Right on. <laughs> Member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to Member Opposite for the question. This government has made record investments in all of our health human resources, and we've been doing it since the pandemic began because we want to make sure that we have health human resources. We have hired already, since March 2020, 11,700 new health care providers. College of Nurses of Ontario said the other day that they have registered more Order. new nurses this year already, with two months left to go, than ever before—12,802 nurses. All of these efforts are to make sure that Ontarians get the care that they deserve, and we are going to keep working on these things because we have long said the status quo is not working. That's why we're making changes, and we ask the members opposite to stop opposing all of the solutions we're putting forward. Help us to fix the health care system Spons. for generations. Well Thank you. The next question, the member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Speaker, all Ontarians should feel proud of the great history of medical and science research from our post-secondary institutions that has saved lives and changed the world. Just one example, we only have to look across the street to the University of Toronto to see the Banting and Best Diabetes Centre, which is Canada's leading centre for innovation in diabetes research 
education, and clinical care. My own personal experience of having spent 25 years at St. Lawrence College in Kingston, I'm very aware of the wonderful research being done at that institution. To this day, we know of the positive role that our colleges and universities, hospital research institutions continue to play when it comes to innovations and progress in our health care system. Speaker, can the Minister of Colleges and Universities please inform the House on what is being done currently by our government to support these investments? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Hastings, Lennox and Addington for that important question. This government understands that investments in college and university hospital research not only strengthens Ontario's existing innovation and commercialization capacity, but also grows our province's professional and skilled workforce and positions us as a global leader. Our government is supporting research and innovation that leads to this discoveries and advancements that make a real impact in people's lives. Ontario will be supporting innovation with an investment of more than $198 million in research projects at colleges, universities, and research hospitals across the province. This funding will support 241 research projects across this province, and these projects will be integral in building, renovating, and equipping research facilities with upgraded technology and supporting research to attract new research talent. We will continue our Response. commitments and efforts in strengthening Ontario's college and universities hospital research initiatives that provide college and university hospitals with the ability to adopt advanced technologies to remain competitive and move Ontario forward. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Even before the COVID-19 outbreak, it was imperative that our government showed leadership to address the shortfalls of the previous government when it came to investing in our research and innovation sector. Our government has worked towards ensuring that the province's most vulnerable people receive the care that they need. So working with so many stakeholders, our government has often talked about the investments in hospitals and strengthening our province's public health sectors. Speaker, can the Minister of Colleges and Universities elaborate further about the initiatives that our government has invested to support a ro more robust health sector? Well, thank you once again to the member for this, raising this important issue. Ontario has incredible researcher potential, and we are working to realize this potential through investments in important research organizations like the Ontario Health Data Platform Intellectual Property Committee. Speaker, through groups such as this one, we are ensuring that researchers are able to access invaluable de-identified de data to support the work of our healthcare sector. This government is proud to stand behind investments like this one and will continue to work with all post-secondary institutions and research organizations across the province to ensure we continue to increase Ontario's research and innovation capabilities to help build healthcare capacity and create more jobs, opportunity and growth for our economy. It's also exciting to look across the other corner to see the new U of T Biomedical Research Centre. Wow. And uh, stay tuned for more. Great. Question, the member for Toronto, St. Paul. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities states person-centered care, secure housing of choice for life, and participation in community life are human rights for people with disabilities. But for Jonathan, a constituent of mine with developmental disabilities, he's been deprived of each of these as he's been warehoused in a hospital for over a year, Speaker. The very basics he deserves as a human being, like a hug from his mother or simply having his nails clipped, have been kept out of reach from him. Meanwhile, the wait for the supportive housing he needs in community is up to 40 years long, Speaker. My question to the Premier, can the government explain the choice to deprive Jonathan of his fundamental human rights? And can the government explain why the Premier has not responded to to Janet Abramson, who's sitting in the gallery, who is, is Jonathan's mother, for over a year now. She's been asking the Premier for five minutes on a phone call, and they will not respond. Question. Can the government explain why Jonathan is left, being left behind in hospitals? Why is he being left, left behind? He needs supportive housing today. Thank you. And to respond, Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you very much for the question. You know, when we took office, 
we saw that adults with developmental disabilities uh, and their service providers were continuing to face many of the same problems uh, over many, many years. And it was our government that developed uh, a journey to belonging. It's about including people in the community. It's about creating a place for them to live where they can achieve the life that they want to live. It is about inclusion. It is about belonging. And those are powerful words. That was in May 2021. And we had started that work when we began as a government. And we consulted with uh, various groups across the province. Between November and December 2020, we held eight virtual sessions with over 190 participants, including individuals with lived experience, family members, and service providers. We also received nearly Response. 900 written submissions. We're making both immediate and long-term improvements to developmental services in Ontario. We want people to be able to live in their communities where they belong, to belong, and have a life of meaning and purpose. And we're going to continue to... Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, Janet is in the gallery. Will the minister and the premier look at Janet? Look at her. She's a person. My question is back to the premier. Report after report shows that investment in an independent living doesn't just respect Jonathan's human rights. It is far more cost efficient. Without it, people with developmental disabilities end up in hospitals or long-term care where their care is compromised because of this government's cuts. This is why we, the official opposition, prioritize the building of 60,000 supportive housing units in Ontario, because it's an investment that is fiscally responsible and also ethical. My question is back to the Premier. This government talks a big game on being fiscally responsible. Will you turn your words into action? Will you house Jonathan? Will the government create independent living for tens of thousands of people with developmental disabilities who deserve to live their best life? And will you give her five minutes on the phone. Your staff said you were too busy. Question. She's right there. Look at her. Thank you. Once again, remind members to make their comments through the chair. To reply on behalf of the government, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, um, you know, uh, through you to the member for Toronto St. Paul, so I appreciate her passion uh, on this issue. It just seems that, uh, that it just seems that uh, I'm glad she's, uh, she's talking about housing supply. You know, during debate in one of our previous housing supply action plan, the member for Toronto St. Paul stated actually in this house the statement that more houses is not necessarily the answer. So I'm glad that uh, that we can we can look forward. In fact, the, the member for Toronto Rosedale said last week that she wanted to see a comprehensive plan. This is exactly order what we've put forward. We've put forward a comprehensive order. The member for Toronto St. Paul's come to order. Housing opportunities for Jonathan and other individuals in the province of Ontario. We're going to continue to build more, to support more, and to ensure that everyone has a safe, secure place to call home. Order. The next question, the member for kitchener conestoga very much, Mr. Speaker. As we all know, the last two years have proven to be very challenging for many parents and students. The recent EQAO data shows that most Ontario students, like students all across Canada, are struggling with math. I've also heard from many parents who say their young children's reading skills are not progressing as they should, Mr. Speaker. After the pandemic and with union-driven strikes, it's fair to say that we cannot take children out of class. We now have an opportunity to help Ontario students recover. And Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Education. What is being done to help our children recover from these learning losses? Mm -hmm. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member for Kitcher Conestoga for his question as a parent and advocate uh, to making sure children remain in school. Mr. Speaker, we are investing more in our students, in our schools, and in our parents because we know part of Ontario's plan to catch up. The first pillar is keeping kids in class. And that's why, Speaker, we've expanded supports because we recognize learning loss is a challenge across this nation and the world. It's why we've expanded tutoring, $175 million, the largest tutoring program, the only one of its kind in this country to allow small group interventions with a focus on reading, writing, and math. For the first time next September, we're going to have a new screening program for kindergarten, grade one, and grade two kids so that we understand their literacy capabilities and we help to get them back on track. Mr. Speaker, we also have a new math curriculum finally 
literally eliminating the former Liberal government's discovery math curriculum with a modern skills focus emphasis on life and job skills, coding and financial and digital literacy critical for the jobs of tomorrow. Mr. Speaker, in addition, we've expanded tutoring virtually and online. And we also recognize for new educators in this province, we feel so strongly we're taking this case in the courts, that a new educator in Ontario should be able to have a basic grade nine math standard. This is the plan to get kids back on track, and it starts, Speaker, with keeping kids in school. Supplementary question. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. And uh, with that said, there are still many families in my riding, like the Stevens family, uh, who are, are experiencing financial hardship due to soaring inflation, Mr. Speaker. Hardworking parents across this province are struggling with the stress of day-to-day -day costs yeah. on top of supporting their kids' education with the tools and supports that they need for success. These are unpredictable economic times marked by increased costs that are across the board. And parents, now more than ever, can use financial relief that will ease the costs associated with their children's learning recovery, Mr. Speaker. Parents need flexibility so that they can best spend those dollars to help their kids catch up. So, Speaker, uh, on behalf of hardworking parents in my riding, can the minister inform this House on what our government plans to do for the parents that are in financial need? Mr. Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. We do recognize, as progressive Conservatives, that there is great instability in the global economy and there's a real impact to the cost of living for the families we all represent. It's why we believe, for the fourth time, we should be providing direct financial support to the parents of this province. Again, we're providing a catch-up payment, $200 for every child up to age 18 and $250 for every school-age child. Uh, up to age 21 with special education needs. To date, there's over 850,000 applications. We just opened the uh, website just a few days ago. It shows and it underscores the need in this province and country for financial relief. In addition, Speaker, it was our government premier that cut the gas tax by 10 cents. Our government that reduced taxes for the lowest income Canadians to lift tax credit. It was our government that provided a child care deal that will provide a literal 50 percent reduction by Christmas of this year, $6,000 in the Response. bank. These are meaningful ways we can support families, support children, and our economy through this instability here at home and around the world. My question is to the Premier. Street Outreach Services, known as SOS, provides a critical service to vulnerable people in Thunder Bay. For those experiencing homelessness, the SOS van provides a warm space, meals, transportation to shelters, and has literally saved lives these last two winters. Unfortunately, Thunder Bay's Shelter House has announced that it must permanently close its SOS service because it hasn't been able to secure funding. Will this government step forward and supply the funding needed to keep people alive this winter in Thunder Bay? Thank you, Member for Thunder Bay Superior Board. Response, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you so much, and I want to thank the honourable member for that uh, that comment. I was just in uh, Thunder Bay with my parliamentary assistant, uh, MPP Holland. Uh, met with many stakeholders, and we had a fantastic announcement with uh, the Matawa First Nation. Fantastic project uh, to build uh, more homes uh, in that in in that area. So it was a was a great day. I appreciate uh, the fact that. Uh, the Honourable Member is bringing forward the, uh, the, the shelter challenges. Uh, we've been very open with the DSAB in Thunder Bay. We've provided a significant amount of dollars under the Social Services Relief Fund to support the shelter and to support uh, the vulnerable populations. We'll continue to work with the DSAB as we move forward. I, my understanding is they haven't allocated their fifth phase of the Social Services Relief Fund. We'll continue to work with them on homelessness programs in, in Thunder Bay and appreciate the member bringing the matter forward. Supplementary question. Thank you. Uh, the Harris Conservative government downloaded many social service responsibilities. Order. Uh, already overburdened municipalities, and this government is at the helm of a collapsing social safety net. In Thunder Bay, SOS is actually one of three key outreach services that doesn't have funding to operate this win winter. What each of these services needs is core operating funding so that there will never again be a question of whether or not they can be available. Annabedi Achni Panishkum, Deputy Grand Chief with Nishnabiaski Nation, notes that 
with Thunder Bay being the hub for many individuals, not only First Nations but other individuals who come here for services, the lack of street outreach threatens lives. With winter quickly approaching, will the Premier move further to do what is necessary and provide Question. the funding needed to keep these important street outreach services open in Thunder Bay? The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that question. Just recently, actually last week, I was in Thunder Bay and had the opportunity, along with uh, our member from Thunder Bay, Atacokan, to meet at the United Way and to meet the people that were involved in SOS and look at it as an important part in the continuum of care that we're looking to build, not just uh, in Thunder Bay, but around the province, in all rural, remote communities and in the cities. One of the things that we learned about it was it is a piece that's necessary, but in addition to that, we also have to look at the housing needs, and that's something that the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing is looking at, and we are taking an all-of-government approach, along with the legislation that we're looking to bring forward and have passed, to ensure that we have that continuum of care, because we understand that the individuals, whether they be living on the street or whether they're individuals in need Response. of support, need to have housing if we want to ensure that they do not end up on the street again. So we are looking at it, and we are working with the community to ensure that those supports and services are there. Next question, the member for Ajax. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I understand the need. This is to the, the minister, Associate Minister of Women and Economic Affairs. As a woman, I understand the need to help women across Ontario thrive at home, at work, and especially in my community of Ajax. One of my top priorities is helping to remove barriers to economic security and prosperity. By working with community organizations, we can lift women up and empower them to excel in business, leadership role, as well as entrepreneurs, and in sectors where they're often mis underrepresented. In the investment in the Women's Futures program partners with community organizations across the province and has a proven track record of bringing women off the sidelines and into the heart of our economy. Speaker, can the Associate Minister of Women's and Social and Economic Opportunities please tell us what she's doing to ensure the growth of this great program? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and I thank the Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Education uh, for the question, and thank you for the work that you're doing to address the barriers that prevent w women from entering and re-entering the workforce. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to take a moment to highlight an inspiring quote from a woman that I met in Thunder Bay. Her name was Sarah a woman who recently attended an IWF recipient center that successfully supported her in pivoting to the online market during the pandemic. Sarah said, I realize I can do a lot more than I thought I am able and capable of. I just needed the proper education and support system with female mentors. I now feel my future will be different and I'm able to build on my skills. Awesome. Mr. Speaker, when women re-enter the workforce and have wraparound supports, the mentorship and counseling Response. programs offered through IWF are vital to their success. And when women feel supported, it builds their confidence and helps them address the challenges. We are going to continue to do that, Mr. Speaker, because we know this program works. Here, here. The uh, time for question period has now expired. That concludes our question period for this morning. And I want to remind members that, uh, and, and ask them to remain in the chamber after we recess the House for the group photograph that we have planned. Pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for Toronto St. Paul's has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services concerning developmental disabilities. This matter will be debated today following private members' public business. Now we have a